Okay, thank you, Joan, and um, firstly for your kind words and your, your nice introduction. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the organisers for their kind invitation to present at this conference. So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Congress on Youth Coaching. It's a pleasure to contribute to this wonderful forum. My task today is to present to you some insights into, one, understanding youth and development, and in understanding youth better, that should inform, secondly, the work of high performance youth coaches, and thirdly, how they learn to do that work. Now, much of my presentation will be focused on understanding behaviours of self uh, and others. Next slide, please. Yep. Understanding behaviour is very complex. First, we need to appreciate that uh, context matters. Right? Behaviour is a function of the person in context. So who we are and how we behave depends on who we are with. Contrary to what many people think, we don't always behave the same in all contexts. We adapt our behaviours dependent upon the norms and values of the various contexts in which we function. And we're trying to fit in. And that may be very different in how we function in sport, work and at home. So to understand people, we need to understand there are multiple layers of a person um, and how that person operates in a particular context. We're going to go from strong genetic or hereditary influences to increasingly more social and cultural forces at play that shape who you are and how you behave depending on who you're with. So firstly, to understand people, we need to consider these four layers of a person. Right, the bottom layer of understanding people is all part of human evolution. So psychological needs or universals are innate needs that um, we have uh, over our evolution uh, shaped and reshaped. And the three psychological needs that we think uh, we have when we're born, regardless of uh, gender, regardless of culture, uh, autonomy, that is the perception we have some say in some things, confidence in being able to um, manage and work in a, both a social world and a physical world. And the third uh, psychological need we have is that of belonging. The layer that sits above needs are traits. And most people, when you talk about personality, think about people's personality traits. And what I can say about traits is that um, the latest research would say that 40 to 50% of our traits are inherited, not necessarily from your immediate parents, but somewhere in your genetic tree. And they start to stabilise around 20 to 30 years of age. Our behavioural signature, which are, is our traits, reflects how we typically behave across contexts. So we might have a social reputation of being a hard worker, being a very calm person. So these are our traits. The next layer is about goals and values. And around about 8 to 12 years of age, children start to think about what they want to achieve. Maybe it's also what they want to avoid. It could be, I, don't, I want to avoid looking incompetent. So children at a very young age through childhood are very much goal driven. This is when they start to think about I want to be an Olympian. I want to be a doctor. I'd like to be a policeman or a policewoman. Understandably, our goals are influenced by social forces, especially family and school, and continues through midlife. The final layer of a person um, is related to the self and the stories that we tell ourselves. Understanding our self or our identity um, is essentially trying to answer the question, who am I? And at about 8, 16 to 25 years, probably earlier for girls compared to boys, we start to make sense of significant events in our lives and how they shape us as people, and this continues through life. Uh, next slide, please. Now, a key point I want to make here is that development in youth or adolescence is arguably the most traumatic period in our lives. We experience significant physical changes due to puberty, 
but also during this period, adolescents experience significant psychosocial emotional development. This is a turbulent and uncertain period of development that is uniquely experienced. Challenging authority is part of this opportunity for independence and initiative during this period. And this is necessary for personal growth and development. Due to these challenges, many adults view youth as troublesome and therefore in need of fixing. And adults typically resort to controlling behaviours to prevent inappropriate youth behaviours. Next slide, please. Yep. Now, I don't know about in Singapore, but certainly in Australia, we often hear adults saying how badly youth are behaving and, um, and they're comparing that to when they were teenagers. Youth today are so much worse. But are youth behaving worse than in previous generations? What do you think? This turbulence of adolescence and what appears to be disrespect for adults is not new. The ancient Greeks wrote about the turbulence of youth uh, and how disrespectful young children were uh, as teenagers back in the 8th century BC. So this has been uh, an ongoing dialogue from um, BC and uh, scholars continue to write about this difficult period of development ever since. Yeah, for 14, my father was ignorant. I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. So this really highlights um, the, the role of parents through this critical period is very different to the role they have during childhood and post-adolescence post, uh, as well. So... Thinking about the role of parents and the shifting role of parents provides opportunity for other adults to perhaps have some influence. And an important point I want to make here is that peers and coaches are very significant influences on adolescents' thinking and their behaviours. This means that coaches are in a very important role to shape youth development. This is an important responsibility to role model that is our behaviours, so that we can actually influence in adaptive ways the next generation of adults. Next slide, please. As I said before, a key issue for youth is working out, who am I? There is tension between who do I want to be and who should I be? Of course, social force is a powerful influence during this period of coming to better know who I am. A significant point is that youth want peer acceptance. This is for most youth the most important aspect of this period of development. Do I belong? Am I in the in group or am I in the out group? They also want to have a say in things. They want to have independence. They want to have autonomy in some things. And it's also a critical period of answering the question, am I worthy? Self-esteem is significantly challenged during this period of development. So during this period, um, some youth behaviours might seem irrational and inappropriate. Often youth don't think of consequences. Right? Their brain's still developing and they're quite impulsive, probably more so males and females. It's also important to recognise that youth experiences are unique. And it's unique in terms of time, place, context and situation. So the experiences of adolescence are not the same for everyone. The journey through puberty is generally the same, but the timing of that journey and the challenges it might bring are not similar, even within the same family. Our two sons had completely different physical growth patterns from 13 to 20 years of age. One was quite steady and linear uh, in his, his growth patterns, whereas our yeah, youngest son he didn't grow until well after high school. How I look is very important for youth feeling they belong, and especially with their peers. And because we're going through significant uh, pubertal changes in uh, who we are and how we look, this is a significant challenge for young people. And compared to childhood, adolescents want to make more decisions. 
However, the security of childhood is replaced with the uncertainty of adolescence. What is the right decision? Youth experience many stresses as they attempt to navigate through adolescence. And many of these stresses are related to their peers, their parents and other adults, such as coaches and teachers, and the tensions and the different uh, uh, influences that these different actors have. But the search for a clear identity shapes this challenging period of development. Next slide, please. So in summarizing youth development, and this is important for people to know, because I don't think we typically spend much time in understanding development, uh, in, in coach development uh, activities, professional development activities. But it is often very stormy and there's conflict or tensions as they try to establish who they are, their identities and independence. They are often very uncertain and feel inadequate and insecure. And this tension between the security of childhood and the pursuit of autonomy in progressing towards adulthood is palpable. They certainly worry about their appearances. Am I capable? And they certainly worry about their relationships, particularly with peers. And importantly, self-esteem is really challenged. And this might be more so for girls than boys. And it might be worth knowing that girls probably need to belong and feel that they belong before they perform well. Whereas boys, it's probably the other way around. Boys need to perform and feel competent to feel that they belong. I'll be interested in what your experiences are and what you think about that comment. So only this period is characterized by significant peer group influences, which at times leads to changes in attitude and behavior, as well as conflict with established values. And these tensions undoubtedly cause emotional swings in young people. But the good news is towards the end of adolescence, self-identity is established for most people. And teenagers feel increasingly more comfortable with who they are. And they start to then turn their attention toward what they might become. Next slide, please. So typically, adults take a preventative approach to uh, youth development. And they have this view, typically, in most societies, that youth are troublesome. And these are they're a problem to fix. Therefore, we focus on rewards and punishment to shape behaviour. But preventing youth misbehaving does not build their capabilities. Prevention does not prepare youth to become fully functioning adult citizens. All right, so prevention does not equal development. In contrast to the behaviorist approach in psychology, which is shaped by rewards and punishment, the positive psychology movement and the subsequent positive youth development program and approach offers an alternative a way of doing business. How can we build appropriate assets in young people so that they can thrive as adults in and through sport? And sport has been found to be a significant forum or context in which assets can be built in young people. But just by turning up to play sport, uh, we shouldn't assume that sport's going to contribute to their assets and their subsequent development. The work of learner and learner created the four or five C's, and certainly this has been adapted for sport through the work of John Cote and his colleagues in Canada. And the four C's that you would be familiar with, because I know John Cote presented a couple of years ago at this conference, the four C's include the perceptions that you're competent, that you're confident, that you have connection with others, and that sports are an opportunity and a forum in which we can develop good people. We develop their character. This is about moral development. And in developing these assets, we can contribute to youth continuing to engage in sport long enough so that they can improve their performance and develop adaptive psychosocial emotional skills to subsequently thrive in society. Children and youth need to be in the sport system long enough to benefit from the potential it has as a vehicle to promote positive youth development. So coaches are central to the quality of the sporting experience. Right? So what you do and how you do it and the way you interact with young people will have an influence on their subsequent growth and development 
um, as they mature from adolescence into adulthood. So some implications for coaching youth athletes might include, we need to think about, because there's these uh, significant emotions, uh, swings in emotions, that how do we help shape and develop their self-regulation skills? And certainly the way that we behave, um, we're modeling those sorts of behaviors uh, in front of them. So how we behave is very influential in what they model, uh, particularly in terms of our own ability to self-regulate our thoughts and our emotions. We would strongly encourage you have conversations with young people, right? And these conversations should engage beyond them as a performer. When you engage with young people and ask about their dreams and hopes and goals beyond sport, they're going to feel valued as people, not just as performers. So we need to actually ask questions. We need to actually then, as a consequence, to listen and paraphrase back what, we're, what we think we're hearing. And hearing actually means respond to what they're saying. So typically coaches, um, shaped by behaviorist approaches, use uh, pedagogical approaches such as telling people what to do. But we need to shift and we need to shift to using an inquiry-based approach to, to coaching which, in which we do ask questions, we do listen, and we do hear. We also need to provide some opportunities for athletes making some decisions. And this becomes very important during adolescence. They want to have some say. They want to feel that they have two hands on the steering wheel and they have some, some perceptions of being in control. So young people have these fundamental needs of being competent, in control, and being autonomous. I want you to think about, do you provide opportunities for athletes to have some independence and to have some initiative? And what does this look like both in terms of your daily training environment and also in terms of competitions and matches? When you give people opportunities for independence and initiative, you're promoting their sense of competence. They feel valued, so therefore it contributes to their sense of belonging. And they feel they have some choice. Right? And that promotes their sense of autonomy. The next point is, are you focused on a mastery approach? Sport is a highly contested space. It's all about ego. It's all about winning. And winning has the highest currency. And we need to balance our language and our communication messages to also focus on a mastery approach. Answering the question, am I contributing to the athlete getting better? Am I helping him to understand that ability is, should be self-referenced as well as norm-referenced? Am I improving as well as am I proving myself by being better than others? So a mastery approach has a lot of empirical support in the literature. And the final point I want to make here is that how do you go about making the athletes feel they belong? If a sense of belonging is central to who we are as people, as part of our human evolution, and uh, we are in pursuit to satisfy this need to belong, particularly through this period, what are you doing in the way you coach and how you coach to actually promote that they feel that they belong? And another word you might think about in terms of belonging is to what degree are you tolerant of difference? Do you accept them for who they are? Or are you trying to shape them to be the person you think they should be as opposed to who they want to be? Now, as I said before, context matters. How and what we coach depends on who we coach and their motives for sport. Have you ever asked your athletes why they play sport? And have you continued to ask this question throughout their journey? What are their goals? And have those goals changed over time? And why might those goals be so important to them? Right, this is part of the conversations we need to have with young people. And it's important to acknowledge that although you might be coaching athletes in the performance pathway, right, the health and well-being of athletes should be first and foremost. 
Uh, if you go back to the developmental model of sport participation uh, developed by Cote, the three P's are about ongoing participation to benefit from our participation um, in and through sport, to contribute to improvements in performance, to become more competent, and also contribute to the psychosocial emotional development of young people. Now with reference to Cote's model, um, the athletes you're coaching are progressing through two significant periods, which are transition periods from childhood to adulthood. And these are the specialization and the investment stages. Right? Athletes by this, this stage of development have probably decided to focus on one or two sports, maybe three, and they start to engage in more specialized training over a longer period. And they become more committed to regular and multiple training sessions. And most of these training sessions are focused on deliberate practice. Practice that's going to improve their personal performance. Because the focus tends to be in a performance pathway on successful performance outcomes. But I come back to, we shouldn't ignore and we should always be foregrounding the importance of uh, personal health and well-being in addition to performance. And those two outcomes aren't independent. They're actually related to each other. So in continuing with this theme that context matters, you as a coach actually create the environment in which people operate. And a stable and a functional coach-athlete relationship is central to improving athlete performance and promoting health and well-being. In addition to this turbulent period of physical and psychosocial development, we might consider some other challenges related to the context in which you coach. So a key issue is keeping young athletes in the system long enough to improve and grow. I've made this point a couple of times. This is arguably our greatest challenge in coaching, keeping young people in sport. Retention is a significant issue. In the Australian context, the peak age participation in sport is between 9 and 11 years. That sends a message to the Australian sports system and people who, who design policy and practice that young people, young children are barely in the sports system and they're starting to drop out. And we certainly know that there are significant periods of transition uh, out of sport um, going from primary school to secondary school and from secondary school into universities and work. So this is a significant issue in sport and sports need to focus on how do we improve the quality of our product and how do we deliver that product as well as we can to retain young people in the system. That is our challenge and coaches are central to the way you design, create as architects and sculptors of the learning environment. There are also often tensions between the perceived need to win. And I want to make this point, it's not just the perceived need to win um, and that tension between what is the best long term for the athletes, right? And that also includes their health and well-being. We're not saying that you shouldn't be pursuing uh, to win. Right? Athletes are doing that all the time. No one goes into a competition not to be successful. No one goes into a competition, I hope I lose. Everyone's doing the best they can. The problem is the overemphasis on winning that can come at the cost of who they are as a person. So in that pursuit of being the best they can be, and, and, and as coaches designing the learning environment, we need to think about how much do we push athletes, particularly through this period of significant physical and psychosocial change. Right? And how much we push athletes should consider other challenges um, through this period of development. And one thing, a, a basic principle is, the more you challenge a young person or anybody, the more you have to support them. And we need to challenge them in, in small steps, incremental steps, as opposed to trying to push young people through too quickly. All right, so we need to match challenge with similar levels of support, and we must be patient. Development takes time. 
One thing we've learned um, over 40 years of research on, on talent ID, the only thing we can say with some confidence is that the older one is, the more we can predict who might likely go on to become um, an elite athlete. I'm unsure about the sports system in Singapore. I was there about uh, 10, 10 to 20 years ago. But in many countries, athletes are likely to be caught in that tension between the school and school sport and club sport representative teams. And one of the challenges we have is that neither organisation seems to be thinking about what's in the best interests of the athlete. So in the Australian context, the school and club sports systems don't talk to each other. And the consequence of that is that young people get torn between trying to please both the school and the club. Because no one's taking responsibility to look after what's in the best interest of the young person. And how do we get clubs, uh, club sport, community sport and school sport systems to actually talk to each other? So consequently, many athletes overtrain and they burn out and are lost to the system. Indeed, sometimes the system fails young people. It's not their intention, but sometimes our, our systems don't work well because our ego gets in the way of what's in the best interests of young people. The final point I want to make here is that remember your expectations and beliefs about the athlete will shape your coaching and subsequently how the outcomes. And we call this a self-fulfilling prophecy or the pin effect. When coaches are positive in their expectations of their athlete, those athletes will engage more and are likely to work harder and become more successful. Alternatively, when we have low expectations or uh, poor expectations of an athlete, it typically leads to their underperformance because they disengage. Coaches aren't always aware of these belief systems. Right? But those beliefs that we have about someone, we prejudge what talent might look like. And in fact, we don't always have a good understanding of what talent really means. Right? So how you how you have beliefs and expectations of an athlete will actually come to fruition. All right? I want you to think about, am I treating all athletes in a similar way or am I playing favourites with one athlete over another? All right? It's a major reason why uh, young athletes uh, drop out of sport is because they don't feel that the coach thinks that they're capable. The final point I want to make here um, is this greenhouse effect. Now this this greenhouse effect was something we wrote about um, in a in a and it was a key finding in a study that we did on serial winning coaches. These were coaches, fourteen of them, who collectively had won over one hundred and fifty gold medals and trophies. So some of these coaches were um, in professional leagues like hockey and football, and there was just one trophy a year. So these are the outliers amongst the outliers. What they and their athletes reported was the importance of and the necessity of creating a learning environment that is predictable and stable. When we have a predictable and stable learning environment uh, where there's a sense of trust and acceptance, right, there's going to be opportunity for athletes to thrive and flourish. Coaches need to be consistent with how they behave and the implicit and explicit messages they send to athletes. Therefore, I'm stressing to you that coaches are performers in their own right. You are a performer. How do you perform? How do you judge your own performance? Do you think about yourself in that way? Am I a performer? How do I, how do I judge my own performance when working with an athlete both in the daily training environment as well as in low level and high level competitions? And what would the athlete say? What would they say about your ability perform, to perform? In the Atlanta Olympics, I was a team coach for Australia in sprints and relays, and I had uh, one of the athletes whom I didn't coach who came up to me and said, um, I love my coach, 
but can you keep them away from me because they're making me anxious? So certainly the coach is not wanting to create anxiety in the athlete. Right? But if we don't think about our own performance, we're not necessarily understanding that our performance can impact the performance of the athletes. So I really encourage you to think about yourself as a performer and how do I improve my capability as a performer? You model the behaviours you want athletes to learn. They are learning from you all the time. They're copying what you do and you don't do. Self-regulation of your thoughts and behaviours need to be consistent to shape their learning and development. It's important to acknowledge that coaching is more than working directly with athletes. When I was a full-time coach, um, very few people really understood my work. Most people only thought working when I was actually visibly coaching. So there's not a great understanding of people outside of coaches who really appreciate how much time and effort goes into um, what we call indirect activities. So to optimise athlete performance and well-being requires a lot of preparation and learning on the part of the coach. So we appreciate how much work coaches do behind the scenes, but not everybody knows that. Right? It's all the planning, it's the reviewing, it's the previewing, going into competitions, it's the recruiting, plus other administrative tasks and public relations work. My challenge to you, though, is that whilst this is important work, can you be more efficient in these aspects of your work so you can spend more informal time with athletes getting to know them as people as well as performers? What's the return on the investment of time we put into some of these indirect activities? I'm not saying not they're not important, but in, in the Australian context, a lot of people spend a lot of time reviewing video footage and I'm not sure to what extent it actually impacts the learning of athletes. Nevertheless, they're important tasks, but over time you would hope in some of these indirect tasks, administration, public relations exercises, we become more efficient and subsequently more effective in how we use that time in terms of athlete development. If we return to the key aims of sport, Coaches need to think about how they create an environment that nurtures athletes' assets, that is the four C's, and in doing so, achieve the three P's as outcomes. Improve performance, personal development, and ongoing participation in sport. And hopefully one of the key outcomes we want is if young people have good experiences in and through sport during childhood and, uh, and adolescence, they might have a long, uh, lifelong love of physical activity, which leads to both physical and psychological health. So we're thinking about how do you go about to achieve the outcome? What do you specifically do that actually promotes people's sense of competence, confidence, connection, and character? And we use a number of metaphors to understand the work of coaches. So the first one is coach as learner, right? And we learned a lot of information from that study on serial winning coaches in 2016. But we also need to think of you as a coach, as a sculptor or as an architect. You design and you massage and shape and reshape the learning environment. You create the greenhouse. As I said before, coaches should see themselves as performers in their own right. And how do I become a better performer as a coach? Because that's going to be very helpful to the athlete. And the other metaphor that we might use, use is that as a coach, you're a leader. You're a role model. right? In terms of uh, who influences adolescence, after peers... It's coaches and teachers who are most influential. Parents get a distant third or fourth. And it's not that they're not valued. It's just, just part of the development. By the time you come back to mid-20s, mid 
young people start to think their parents actually know something, as I said before with Mark Twain's quote. So think about yourself as a learner, as an architect and a sculptor. Think about yourself as a performer and think about yourself as a leader, right? And leadership's about followership. How am I influencing the athletes and how do I know? Right? Athletes will come back to you many years after you've coached them and they'll say thank you. Not all of them, but many will say thank you. But few of them will come back and say thank you for making me a better athlete. Most of them will come back and say to you, thank you for helping me grow as a person. Thank you for helping me become a better person. Thank you for helping me to, to learn how to deal with conflict, how to be a better communicator. And this is where the real passion for coaching comes back. When you get that feedback, you understand the power you have to influence as a leader, the followers who are the athletes to become the best they can be. So in this last section, I wanna focus on you as a learner. So as a learner, you might consider this question. What do I need to know? And the second question would be then, well, why is that important to know? And how do I use that to actually inform my practice? So there's a lot of information out there and it's probably a little overwhelming. The internet is full of information. It's very difficult to know what stands for truth. Right? But there's three forms of knowledge. And all forms of knowledge are important. The unfortunate thing in terms of if we categorize knowledge into professional knowledge, uh, which is about um, understanding the sport, the tactics, the techniques, sports science, and the language of our sport, we also need to know about intrapersonal knowledge, which is uh, what, what we're thinking. Who are we? What's our philosophy? Is our philosophy actually based on values? Right? Do we reflect? And are we creative in the way we coach? And then there's interpersonal knowledge. Right? Which, how do we... Working with people is one of the most challenging things we have to do. As a coach, working with parents is challenging. Working with athletes is challenging. Working with administrators is challenging. So everything's about relationships. But the key point is that all forms of knowledge should, are important and should be valued. Unfortunately, we tend to focus on professional knowledge and competencies, well, which is really important, but we need to get the balance between professional knowledge and competencies and other knowledges and skills. So I emphasize again, coaching is about people. We need to invest time and learning about interpersonal and intrapersonal knowledge. So interpersonal knowledge is about knowing yourself. How well do you know you? And how well do you know others? When you say you know someone, what do you really know? And how do you get the best from athletes and other staff? How do you get people to work together and be on the same page? We work in a highly contested space. Everyone's trying to become better. And there's only, uh, the higher you go in sport, the fewer jobs there really are. I want you to think about how would you rate your communication skills? And would the athletes have the same view as you? One of the things we did with uh, the, the seal winning coaches, we collected, uh, we interviewed both the coach and two of their athletes who'd won a gold medal or a, a premiership. And we were trying to get to see if there was some consistency in how coaches think they behave and the, the, the influence they have and how that compared to, to the athletes. But asking your athletes that question, how am I being helpful? How am I being unhelpful? How might I be of more help? Right? And how do you want me to give you help? These are simple questions, but they should be part of our everyday conversations with athletes. And if we go to intrapersonal knowledge, how clear are you about your values? And understanding that espoused values um, aren't always enacted. It's easy to write about how wonderful your values are and your coaching philosophy, but your behavior reflects your, your values, what's really important to you, and athletes learn what you think is important 
without you saying what they are. Again, think about, are you aware of your beliefs about coaching and the development of young people? Right, a simple question might be, if I posed to you and if I was face to face, I'd be asking, are athletes born or made? And how do you know? What do you think? How well do you reflect on your coaching practices and how much uh, do you invest in becoming the best you can be by a lifelong approach to learning? This is all part of intrapersonal knowledge. So there are many influences on what, how, and why you learn what you do. All right? Much of your learning will be shaped by who you coach and what they need in terms of development. So much of learning is serendipitous. When I was coaching, my learning was focused on how do I help my athletes to solve their problems which were related to both performance and personal development. These athletes shaped and drove my learning, right? Because I'm having to problem solve in situ in a particular situation and context. Importantly, we are heavily influenced by our own learning histories, what we value, what sources we access and have access to. This can be both helpful and unhelpful. Therefore, passion and curiosity is essential for you to become the best you can be. Only you can drive your own learning. No one else can make you better. That is up to you. I learned this early in my career. No one else can make me learn. That is my choice. Over time, you should expect that your pursuit of knowledge helps you to understand things more deeply. And you start to challenge why you do what you do. It's all part of the learning journey, the journey of becoming becoming the best you can be. Furthermore, we come to realize that one size doesn't fit all. Athletes are unique in how they respond to our coaching. Therefore, we need to individualize our coaching as much as possible. My final message is that learning can take many different formats. And again, all sources of learning should be valued for their potential contribution to you as a learner. You need to work out where you invest your time and effort in becoming the best you can. Therefore, consider a blended approach to learning. There needs to be an appropriate mix that suits you to formal learning, non-formal learning, and informal learning. And all forms of learning have strengths and limitations. So I emphasize the need to engage with all forms of learning over time. Challenge yourself. Go out of your comfort zone. What we've found over time is that coaches access different forms of learning at different stages of their career. For example, um, early in your career, I was influenced by my own uh, university studies uh, and my own experiences in sport. But as I developed my career, I continued to study in formal ways, but I started to then go to more non-formal ways of learning, going to congresses like the one you're attending now. Uh, meeting other people, having conversations about how they coach and why they coach the way they coach. So what we found is that critical friends often become more important to us and our learning as we progress in our careers. And sometimes we are challenged most by coaches in other sports. Our experience is that coaches are more likely to share across sports rather than within sports because it's highly contested. But be receptive to alternative views. Be receptive to new ideas. Any disruption to your beliefs and attitudes can lead to a recalibration of your thinking and practice that in turn will be helpful to your athletes. Coaching experience is important, but in and of itself, it's not sufficient to improve your coaching capabilities. So most coaches will report, they learn most of their, their coaching from actually doing coaching work, which is terrific. However, the challenge with informal or experiential learning it is that it's often unguided, it's incidental, and lacks quality assurance. Therefore, it's necessary to engage in self-reflection about your coaching. And how well do you do that? And how honest are you with yourself? Have you ever videotaped yourself coaching and then reflected back on it? 
And have you ever sought the honest and constructive feedback from a critical friend? They might see you differently. So you could look at your own video of you coaching and then compare that with what a critical friend says. And that's the point for having a conversation. You can't grow and develop as much without feedback to yourself and feedback from outside. And the most important feedback you can get in terms of developing your craft is actually having conversations and seeking feedback from your athletes. Importantly, athletes are probably going to tell you what you want to hear. So over time, you need to encourage them to, to be uh, constructive in their feedback, to give you ideas about how you can be better at what you do. Your growth and development will help athletes to grow and, and develop. In the Serial Winning Coaches study, their obsession with learning was based on their needs to know as much as possible. Because if I know as much as possible, I'm ahead of everybody else, I know more, right? it's more likely that their athletes would perform as best as they could. Okay, next slide. I hope that there was some information um, in what I provided that was both uh, affirming of what you're already doing, and that's one of the benefits of coming to conferences, is that you get affirmation that what you're doing is, is on the money. But I also hope that, that there might be some information in what I presented that might actually challenge and disrupt some of your thinking so that you can learn and grow yourself. Because disruption to what you think is right uh, and to challenge why you do what you do is necessary for your own personal development um, and improvement in coaching practice. And if you become a better coach, you're going to contribute to a more positive uh, experience for young people who will then contribute back, which for, for us is the fifth C. When people have positive experiences in sport, they're more likely to contribute back to society and also in sport. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Prof Mallet. Uh, we got, we're looking at the Q&A and we've got a couple of uh, questions uh, for you. Uh, first up, at what age uh, and performance level do you view goal setting as benefic beneficial or even effective? Um, I think that you can do that at any age. Uh, primary school children are learning goals and goal setting at about eight years of age. So uh, what's important is who sets the goals um, and how they set those goals and what those goals look like. But uh, we've got to be careful that we as coaches don't try to control athletes and set the goals for them. Right, it's always interesting to ask them what they want to achieve. What, what are their goals? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question. If teenage years are turbulent and uncertain, it may even be more difficult for a youth athlete to speak frankly to his or her or her coach. Where can youth athletes go then? Yeah, no, very good question. Um, but the likelihood is they'll go to you before they'll go to their parents. <laughs> and before they go to you, they'll go to their peers. And this is why whether you're, a, you're coaching a squad like I did in athletics or swimming uh, versus a team, how you shape the learning environment um, and how the, the, their peers actually support each other is really important. If you create an environment where uh, the players and the athletes are peer coaching and helping each other, they will talk informally because they feel accepted. Thank you. That's good. Um, last one. Any suggestions how you coaches can manage the outcome demands, that is results, potentially placed on them by their hires versus creating a training environment that emphasizes, uh, emphasizes growth and learning? Yeah, this is, this is a vexed problem that exists in all countries in the world. Um, because one of the unfortunate things, policy shapes behaviour. And typically policy is about um, if a sport's successful, we give it increased resourcing and funding. All right? But we need to change to, to keep people in sport longer and more people um, in sport. Um, we need to increase the base 
and we need to promote the, the importance of growth and learning. Right? Because everyone's trying to win. Right? Everyone's trying to win quicker. Right? So we have to educate up. So leadership's not just about leading down and influencing those below you. It's about trying to lead up and inform policymakers about what's in the best interest. And this is where researchers are important because policy should be shaped by evidence. Right? I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah. Are these development capacities across international borders? How can we be more aware of cultural norms? Uh, especially if we if we are working with athletes from a different background uh, than our own. Yeah, look, another really good question. Um, when I put up the multiple layers of understanding a person, uh, it's understanding that person in context. But what overlays all of that is the culture of the sport and the, the culture um, of of the, the ethnic group that they're they're coaching with. So for me, um, my, I was able to coach people from multiple backgrounds, different, different ethnicities, that actually brought richness and diversity and inclusiveness to the, to the squad. Because if we embrace those differences, and there are going to be differences, right? So let, let me give one example. Um, autonomy in the Australian and Western uh, democracies, autonomy means that I want to have some say in what I do. But in Eastern Asian cultures, what that might, autonomy might be that I'm happy for the coach or my parent to tell me what to do. So autonomy is a fundamental need, but how it plays out might be culturally different. And we need to be respectful of those cultural differences. But people don't talk about those cultural differences if there's no psychological safety in the greenhouse that you create. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mallet. Uh, this will be the end of our Q&A.